Hey everybody, it's your friendly neighborhood DJ Jazz Hands here with Robbie Damon. He is a voice actor for such uh, films as Digimon Try, that's like your newest one that came up. Uh, you're also a voice actor in Sailor Moon, and you've done a lot of different stuff. You're on One Punch Man. <laughs> I am, yeah, totally. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time out. It means uh, the I'm world. I'm super glad to be here, man. Absolutely needs the world. So how'd you get started in voice acting? Oh man, you, you let off with like the classic question. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I figured, you know, start, start with uh, the classics and then kind of get into some of the other stuff a little bit later, you know? I, I get it. You're just throwing me the uh, softballs now and then the hard stuff's going to come later. Exactly. Uh, yeah, man. Well, uh, I, I always um, was an actor growing up. It's what I went to uh, undergrad and grad school for. And then um, when it was time to, you know, go pro, I had to decide sort of what medium I was going to pursue. And um, voice acting just seemed like a natural choice for me. Awesome. That's so cool. So you were born here in St. Louis. Yeah. You were born in I'm a, lo I'm a local yokel, man. Yeah, exactly. Which is like, okay, first off, it's so cool because I, I want to be a voice actor one day. So it's always really awesome to meet somebody that's not only in the industry that I want to work in one day, but is from here. It's like, <gasps> Dreams can come true. You can go from <laughs> you, you hear. There's, not, there's not a lot of us out there, and I, uh, you know, I get a chance to travel around uh, and meet people from all different parts of the country and the world. And uh, you know, when they find out that I came from sort of a small town in the Midwest, that's always something exciting for them because you know it, there's that stigma that you can't get out. But um, but you know, I always tell them you don't have to get out to be happy and successful, but it's totally possible if you want to too. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of like leading into my next, you know, question is, you know, what were some of the steps you took to kind of get out of St. Louis in a way? I know that sounds bad because it's like you said, you're ha you can be happy here, 100 happy, but oh yeah, know, for for people it's, wanting to, St. Louis is a it's a great town, man. I got I've got nothing but love for St. Louis. Um, no, I grew up in a small town like maybe 50 miles east called Warrington, Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, super small. And uh, and then uh, when my mom remarried, we moved into, like, the Burbs. We moved into St. Peter's. Actually, first we moved into an even smaller town, New Melly, which is uh, outside of Defiance, Missouri. And then uh, I went to high school, normal public high school, and then I do enrolled at Lindenwood University uh, my senior year. And already by then I was, you know, doing professional plays, community theater, and stuff like that. And then... Uh, and then um, I like did like the morning announcements and that kind of thing. And I was a theater kid, uh, <laughs> but you know I played play sports, did all that stuff too. And then uh, I got accepted to Webster University, and that was sort of like a big thing for me because I was super into what I thought their program was back then. And then I sort of found out that I didn't want to be that close to home anymore, mm -hmm. and uh, I decided I want to transfer out of the program for you know a bunch of reasons. And, uh, and then when I did, I was like, well, where am I going to go, east or west? And, uh, and I decided to, to head west. And, uh, you know, I did summer stock all through college, uh, traveling around kind of back when you could do that and, like, make a living in theater. And then, uh, you know, that sort of gave me the bug of, okay, I, I can move around and, and, and do this as a living. Okay, cool. Well, so, like, would you say that – were you definitely, like, afraid to kind of, like, leave? Like, because I, I would always assume I know – a lot of other people have done it. You know, it's like they want to leave home. They want to pursue their, you know, dreams <laughs> of acting. But it's also like, well, what if I take that step and trip or something like that? You know, were, were, were you like a little bit nervous or scared when you decided, hey, I do want to leave and I want to just go for it? I think anytime you take a new step in life, there's a little bit of trepidation. But um, dude, I'm kind of a tactician. Like, uh, <laughs> like I like to be prepared for stuff. So uh, I definitely had, like, my plans and backup plans, and, and that always makes it easier. Like, we'll, there, I'll, I'll meet some, sometimes I'll meet, like, a, you know, an 18-, 19-year-old kid, and they'll be like, I'm going to move to hell, L.A. and, you know, go after it. And I'm like, wait, 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 no, 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 wait. <laughs> Let's talk about, like, your plans. Because, um, you know, it, it is daunting, no matter where you're from, to, to move to a, a big city or away from your comfort zone or, you know, you leave your family, your friends, all that stuff. So... Of course, but um, the best thing is to be prepared for sure. Awesome, awesome. So would, would you say that your career like really started expanding? And I guess it's just uh, the national format, but it started really expanding once when you moved to L.A. Yeah, I mean, you know, people who say they want to, 
do sort of acting or voiceover full time. I was like, cool. Are you are you ready to move to to L.A. or New York? And um, you know, it's not necessary. There are plenty of successful local uh, radio talents and voiceover talents, but um, but if you really want to go full time and do the sort of bigger uh, notoriety, uh, higher paying projects, you'll eventually have to move to where the work is. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty, that's that's what that I've always been kind of curious and wondering about, and uh, it's always interesting to hear these type of uh, things when you you know when you, when you hear them. So, did you have anybody? Uh, did you have any of the uh, anybody that you, uh, inspired you when you were growing up that like you would watch and you'd be like, okay, I have I I want to be an actor like that, or I need to do this because of this person, or did you have anybody growing up that uh, really inspired you? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's I think that kind of stuff starts close to home. My my mother and my grandfather were super musical and very talented artistic people, and my mom, my stepdad is a really sort of salt of the earth like super smart uh, working man. So that's where I got my, my very first um, sort of inspiration to, to say, you know, from my dad's side, if you work hard enough, you can do anything. And from my mom's side, you know, if you have the talent, you have to, to pursue it or you won't be happy doing anything else. But as far as artists go, yeah, man, I grew up watching 90s cartoons, you know, guys like Rob Paulson, Maurice LaMarche, um, Tress McNeil, all of uh, Animaniacs, Looney Tunes. I mean, I would rush home after school to catch the last hour and a half of sort of uh, weekday afternoon cartoons. And, and uh, I probably watched cartoons a little bit longer than I should have. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and then I, um, I got into video games uh, sort of in high school. And, uh, and that's right around the time when video games started getting voice. So then I was like, oh, man, there's going to be a whole new market in the next, you know, few years uh, for voiceover work. And that's when the, the, the sort of uh, idea started to hatch that maybe that's something I want to pursue. Awesome. That's so cool. I love I love hearing all this stuff. Like for me, it's just, yeah. like I said, it's super cool to meet somebody who gets it, you know, understands the small town and is doing what people like to do you know i know i've met so many different voice actors or not voice actors but people who want to be voice actors and so mm-hmm. it's this is really cool <laughs> this is just a really cool experience uh well you know, the great part is, is you're, you're asking great questions too so you're making it easy on me <laughs> <laughs> i hope so I, I i hope so it's one of those things where it's like i never know that the question's good but hopefully as long as <laughs> hopefully as long as you're 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 digging it then that's that's all that really matters then i guess um, of course, of course. Yeah, but now this is kind of going to be a little silly question. But you said you love St. Louis. Do you ever miss? Because uh, you're in Chicago, or not Chicago? You're in California now. Yeah. Um, do you ever miss any of the food? Any of the St. Louis stuff? Oh food? man, listen. So I got a <laughs> I got a couple godkids in St. Louis and some extended family. So I, I make my way back maybe once a year, and uh, you know I gotta get. I gotta get Emo's pizza. I gotta get uh, toasted ravioli somewhere. And uh, if I'm feeling really, really uh, bad, I'll, I'll I'll stop late night and get some White Castle. Yeah. But uh, we just got we just got steak and shake out here, so wow. <laughs> so I don't know. Things are good. I don't know. Things are looking up in LA. That's so cool. That's so cool. So, but now we gotta talk a little bit about Digimon. We have to talk about sure because. Myself and my good buddy Rod were lucky enough to get to see the world premiere of the English dub of Digimon Tribe. Oh yeah, in theaters, which That's was fathom event. Yeah, yeah, great. Which was so cool. It was so cool. So, how did you first uh, learn about the role of playing Joe, or how did you first hear about, hey, we're looking for voice actors for this Digimon project? Well, that's a studio that I work with pretty often, and um, they just sent it to me directly. M- most things come through my agency, but um, uh, I know the I know the folks that work there, so um, they were going to try to get back as many originals as they could, but some people, it's been a long time, have, have left the building. So uh, the original character that, uh, uh, the original actor that played Joe uh, he's not in the business anymore. He, he doesn't live in Los Angeles. He doesn't live in New York. You know, he, he doesn't do voiceover anymore. So, um, so when the part came up, I sort of recognized it as something within the wheelhouse of what I usually do, and uh, and uh, we just took it from there. Yeah. Were you uh, were you a fan of the series beforehand? You know, I I was just a little too old for it. I was like I was a Pokemon kid. Uh, Digimon. I was getting to that age where I was like, ah, I probably shouldn't be watching this. 
So I knew of it. I have lots of friends who, who did the show, but I, I knew right away about the, the cultural significance of it and, um, uh, you know, not just the nostalgia factor, but the genuine love people have for that series. So, uh, so I was real careful, careful going into it to, to make sure and do my best to do it justice. Yeah, because I was, I was, you know, going to say, like, it had to have been, uh, I wouldn't say maybe intimidating, but in some aspects, you know, intimidating be, to go into this franchise that is uh, like a cultural, you know, it has such a cult following and everything like that. Um, how has the fan reaction kind of been for you playing as Joe? Well, listen, man, uh, <laughs> my very first anime role was uh, – was uh, the new dub and redubbing the classic Sailor Moon mm -hmm. uh, as as Tuxedo Mask, and um, that has a huge following. So that was sort of my trial by fire uh, into anime. So I was I was pretty comfortable stepping into a to a role where I knew there'd be like you know uh, a, a very demanding fan base. But um, so far it's been a you know really positive. I mean, you, whenever you're doing something where nostalgia is connected to it, you're never going to make anybody happy. There are some people who want to hear a new take on it because these characters had aged, you know, five, six years. They're in high school getting ready to go into college. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you, you'll probably never make the purists happy unless you do the original voices. And then you'll have other people who hear the original voices and say, oh, they sound dated or or, or, or whatever. So I try to stay off the message boards, man. That's the safest bet. <laughs> Just do the best job I can. But um, everyone I've talked to has been really positive, so that's nice. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, you did a, a fantastic job from what I've heard. Like, it was really nice, and I think it fit Joe a lot for this project. Sorry. It's really nice for you to say, man. I guess the next movie is really his, his big one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so was... hit me back in a couple months and we'll talk about it. <laughs> oh, dude, totally. Because I was going to say, uh, do you know when we'll, when we'll be getting that second dub of uh, Digimon uh, Try Movie 2? You know, I haven't, I haven't heard anything. I haven't started on it. Uh, I don't know any details. And I, I think even if I did, I probably wouldn't be allowed to say. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. So. But, uh, yeah, it does seem like, did you, so I assume you definitely watched the movie, and uh, even though you weren't really into Digimon, do you think that this series, because it's a continuation, is still, like, it's true to the original form, but a little bit more mature for us? Do you think it holds up well for some of the older fans that maybe had lost, or even maybe people like you who, you weren't really into Digimon, but... Do you think this this film could be like? Oh, this is why this this I can understand why people liked this as a kid. Oh, absolutely! I, w I was at the uh, the premiere at the the Chinese theater in L.A. Uh, and got to watch it and uh, sort of a preview of one of the next films. And yeah, absolutely, it's the it's the perfect blend of sort of nostalgia, but like growing up along with it because the fans have grown up too. So um, it's really cool to see these characters. Uh, age and progress but then when they reconnect with their their digimon and uh and, and you get that that fan service and that nostalgia stuff too it's uh i think it's a really uh valid follow-up uh, i'm enjoying it a lot so far yeah it's it's a fantastic fantastic film and i know uh like i said me and uh my buddy rod we we got to do some pretty cool interviews uh that night of the world premiere uh in the movie theater and we've been doing a review of it and so this is a big like thank you for again coming on and getting to talk because this is super cool super cool of you and we oh, appreciate super it. cool to, to meet some uh folks who are so into it and uh that's awesome for me now i have uh kind of noticed uh one thing you uh you you do both the cartoon and the anime voiceover work so for people who may not know really quickly yeah. what that is that's uh when uh uh with americanized voice acting you kind of sit down with a piece of paper and act and they animate it around whereas anime they dub it over um so do you have a craft that you kind of prefer more do you like uh the more english sitting down and having the animators animate over your voice or do you like dubbing a little bit more uh you know that's a great question um you know dubbing obviously is when you're dubbing over something foreign or not necessarily but um you know going to picture uh we call it adr 
And uh, and then prelay is when you you know as you said uh, do an original piece of animation or a video game. Typically, when you're doing an original piece of American animation, you're going to record with uh, the cast or at least a portion of the cast. Um, you don't have the constraints of having to match mouth movements like you do in dubbing. So you know if you're asking what I prefer, I I gotta say I do prefer doing traditional American animation. It's just a little bit more. Freeing. It's you don't have the same kind of constraints. But I love anime, and I love the challenge of anime because um, it's a very technical skill that you you develop and learn and get better at. And um, I love a good challenge. And um, you know, my trial by fire two years ago has um, has turned into something I've really come to love. So you know, I love them both just in different ways. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I I totally understand that. And kind of on the a uh, little bit of a technical side for. Uh, people that want to get into dubbing for anime or their voice talent sure. is they want to dub for anime. When you eventually do the process of dubbing for an anime, um, do they teach you how to do it like on the spot? Like, okay, we're going to throw you into the studio and you're going to sit there and you're going to have to mouth to math flaps and go. Or is it like, do you have to have on your resume before you're even given the opportunity? Like, hey, I know how to do this. And if mm. so... Is there a place that can no, teach you? There's no real sort of anime school. You can go um, do workshops, uh, like Bang Zoom. Uh, the studio offers a great set of workshops. Uh, there, there are private coaches. Um, uh, there are uh, places where you can go and sort of get a little bit of experience before your first trip in. But no, nobody's going to really teach you and hold your hand. It's, it's pretty much trial by fire, and you'll either get it real quick or you, or, or you won't. So... Um, I think that's why a lot of people who are really interested in do things like fan dubs or they or they practice on their own at home because really all you have to do is turn the audio off and you know sync the flaps. But <laughs> but a lot of it depends on um, you know how good your writer are they writing are they writing a really good adaptation that fits within the the beats. You know um, I can definitely tell you from my first day uh, to now and even though I've been doing voiceover for about eight years. My first anime session, like I said, was two years ago. Um, I am way more skilled now than I was back then, uh, you know, and for someone who's been in the business for six years, you know, going in there the first day and, 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 and dubbing make you feel really green. But, um, but most studios are really nice and patient, and if they hired you, it's because they like your voice and they want to make that voice work in their project. So, yeah, I think that's the long and short of it. Okay, cool. That's awesome. To, uh, that's awesome to know. I've often wondered what that process was like. Uh, and kind of another question right. that goes a little bit long with it. I've noticed now because you 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 kind of bounce back and forth between anime and uh, the more Americanized cartoons. But I, I wonder because I see sometimes a lot of voice actors don't do that quite a lot. They'll either stick to uh, like um, um, Greta Lyle or uh, Rob Paulson will stick to more of the cartoons, and then you get um, uh, Sean Schemmel, I guess, and uh, uh, somebody else who just strictly kind of do anime. Would you say that that's more or less in their comfort zone, and so it's more of a comfort zone thing, or is it a studio? If you do this anime, you are contracted to them now, and so you can't really go outside of that contract, and you have to work for this studio. Well, that's a, you know sort of a complicated, multi-part question, but I'll, I'll answer it the best I can. Um, I, I don't think uh, lack of crossover between anime and traditional animation and video games has anything to do with um, you know most people's ability mm -hmm. uh, or their comfort zone. Uh, I think a lot of it has more to do with the inner workings and uh, politics of the business, the opportunities that are presented, how you're viewed within the business, and, and then on top of that, put in your skills. So the people that make a career for themselves in anime and then cross over, you know, usually don't go back to do that much and, and, unless they do like a few select projects, you know. Um, and the, the, like you said, the Rob Paulsons and Great Lyles and all of those folks, you know, they never really did much anime so if we're being completely candid, uh, the pay gap is pretty big uh, between American cartoons that you'd see on Nickelodeon or Disney or Cartoon Network as opposed to the animes you're going to stream or buy or, or, or watch. So, um, you know, there's not much financial motivation to go do anime if you're working very steadily uh, in these AAA sort of animated projects. And then crossing over into that world is much harder. 
And I would say that if you're looking at sort of my career path, my career path is very weird. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you're right, it bounces all over the place. I started do- doing traditional animation before I ever did an anime, and that doesn't happen very often. But um, I like to work, and I like to stay busy, and I, I like to do the convention circuit. That's where a lot of anime, uh, we call that, you know, anime residuals. Mm-hmm. That's where they make their, their, their real money back is by doing uh, appearances. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it's, very, it's very complicated. But um, I would say that crossover isn't by any means a lack of ability. It's just, um, it's just sort of the nature of the business, you know. It's like being an athlete. You know, you know, if you're a really good athlete, you might be capable of, you might be like a Bo Jackson type where you can play football and baseball. But um, odds are going to be a little better at one or the other and a little better known for one or the other. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. I, uh, I like, appreciate that for clearing that, that up because I've often wondered why you didn't hear more of the crossovers except maybe like a select few people uh, that actually do that. So thank you for kind of clearing uh, that one up. Now, do you have a uh, a favorite character or a character at all anywhere that you would love to voice one day? <laughs> I thought you were going to ask like ones that I've done. That's like uh, asking uh, asking you to pick your favorite kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing one right now, and I just can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like uh, I've been working on my, like my, my my dream role for the last year, but um, I can't give anything away. But it's going to be an American cartoon, and uh, it's going to be awesome, and I'm super stoked to do it. But if you take that one away, I would love to be just a super bad, 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 like a bad guy. I want my, uh, I want my like Mark Hamill Joker someday. Uh, and I don't know who that would, I don't know what character that would be, but, uh, but I'm, I'm super stoked for it to come across my desk one day. Cause, uh, I really, I play a lot of like heroes and young guys and, um, goofy characters and I would love to be a bad guy. <laughs> that's so cool that's so cool i know i heard uh was it like the nicest people can play like the biggest bad guys ever and it oh yeah <laughs> i think you would definitely be an awesome... we don't get a chance we don't get a chance to explore that too much in our our, our real life <laughs> exactly, exactly exactly so just a couple more questions and i know your time's sure you know, you know, but uh kind of more of the technical side um for people that are again, looking to kind of break into the industry and work in the industry now. And you mentioned you uh, work with a studio that kind of delivers, hey, these roles are coming up. And how, how would one person go from trying to make a uh, like a, a uh, demo reel to getting a studio or, or um, I guess, a uh, deal um, with a... Uh, industry to kind of like look at them and be like, okay, well now you can kind of do this or we can do this or we can look at you. And what's that technical side right. like? You're, well, your demo is like your headshot. If you're an on-camera actor or a theater actor, you, you got to have a good one. And, um, you know, I'd say most major cities have at least someone who's doing some quality coaching. And a lot of time those coaches offer the services of producing a demo at the end of it. And um, just like everything in life, you know, you get what you pay for. Mm-hmm. And, you know, usually, uh, the demo prices are fair, you know, don't go somewhere and get fleeced, do your research, but um, you got to have a good demo uh, for what you want to do. And then, you know, you take that demo and when you're new in the business, you shop it around just like you would your headshot. And um, there are great resources now online for people who are, who can produce stuff from home with your home setup, you know, like local radio, TV, regional TV, places like voice one, two, three or voices.com that, you know, allow you to cut your teeth before you sort of, you know, go out there and, you know, dive in or, you know, like I said, move to New York, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, you, you got to have those tools. But before you have the tools, you got to have the skills. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. if you're going to do your headshot, you want to make sure you're in the best possible shape you can be in, your skin looks its best, you know, your, your, whatever. And um, with demos, it's even more than that. You got to make sure your skills are up to par. So I would say get the training first then get the tools later and then use those tools to get yourself good representation. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you for that. And, uh, besides, besides kind of that, is there any other like kind of personal advice that you would like to tell, uh, people who want to break into the industry for voice acting? Is there anything personal that you would like to tell them? Yeah. I I say the first thing that you need, if you want to be a voice actor is, uh, to be an actor and, 
the first the first thing you got to do is is learn the musicality of language the intention of the script that you're reading how to cold read there's a whole set of skills that you kind of need to tackle before you ever step behind a microphone and this is just in general you know i'm making a generalization you know some people might be incredibly gifted and they're able to jump right into it but the majority of the people you need to get some training first now whether that be at your local community theater or your college or your high school or uh your local professional uh workshop where you pay to take classes or study a technique you got to be an actor first and then you know it's it's the most important part of voice actor and then um then when you're ready to to step behind that mic and you know you know tackle your dreams of voicing your favorite anime or cartoon or video game character or you know being the next voice of Toyota or McDonald's or whatever um then you'll have the base knowledge to back that up and you'll be able to develop new skills that you'll need behind the microphone so um you got to love it you got to work your butt off no one's going to give it to you and um you know it's a grind like anything else you got to you got to get the skills to pay the bills first <laughs> <laughs> I understand that one, and that's awesome advice. Like, I love, I love when uh, voice actors give really good advice like that, and uh, kind of open people's eyes who uh, want to break in to the industry. And it's you know, open. Yeah. It's like it's a grind. It is hard work. It's very, very hard work, and you got to keep at it. I assume you got to keep at it and keep working yeah. at it. Cause... And, and it's it's uh you know everybody's path is different. You know, you you could get super lucky and get your big break right away or you may never get your big break but you know i'm a i'm just a uh i'm just a country kid from warrenton who went to high school in francis Howell. like if i can do it you know anybody can do it <laughs> you just got to be willing to put in the blood sweat and tears exactly exactly so last question i promise then you are free to go and i you've taken yeah. up so much time and i appreciate every moment of it but is there any projects coming up uh, besides that awesome one that you said is coming out any other projects coming out that you would like to talk about or anything, anything at all that you can talk about, let's say. Sure, sure. I'm, uh, I'm one of the, uh, the four main characters in uh, Final Fantasy XV. Uh, that's a big game coming out uh, this November. So, uh, you know, look out for us, one of the Chocobros. And um, I'll have new shows on um, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, and Disney. Uh, got a bunch of new anime coming out. Uh, One Punch Man and Gundam Iron Blooded Orphans is still on Toonami. And uh, I usually make most of my announcements on my Twitter. So mm -hmm. if uh, any of your, you or your listeners are interested, my Twitter is just my name, Robbie Damon, R O B B I E D A Y M O N D. And uh, you can find me on there. And I, I love to chat with uh, cool people like yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much, Robbie. It, like, this meant the world to me. It meant the world to me. And I'm sure you, you gave us a lot of good information, and I can't thank you enough. Thank you for this. It was great. And hopefully uh, when part two comes out, we can maybe do a little bit of a follow-up interview. And, uh, sounds see how sounds good to me, man. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much. This has been Jazz Hands from 89.5 The Wave.